Good evening and welcome. I'm Abby Wright. I'm the Director of Student Services and thank you for joining us tonight. It is my honor to welcome James Martin. He is the principal of Kyrene Altadena um, Middle School. He has been working in education for over 25 years with a background in school age programming, physical education, and school administration. James is passionate about supporting middle school students and their parents as they navigate the ever-changing challenges associated with middle school and adolescence. Please welcome Mr. Martin. Thank you, Abby. All right, welcome. I get to talk to you guys tonight about two of my favorite topics. One of them is middle school. I'm kind of crazy that way. And the other one is parenting, two things that I'm really passionate about. Um, when, I, when I looked at this and uh, I first saw that I was going to be talking about how to create an incredible student experience, I thought, man, that's a lot of pressure uh, to use that word incredible. But before we move on, I want to answer this question because I always feel like it's important when anytime you speak to people, they're always curious about who is this person and why should we listen to him, which I think is an important uh, an uh, thing to answer for sure. So the first thing I want to start with is to show you a little bit about my personal life, my family. This is me and my family right here. Um, my wife, Kim, and I have three lovely daughters, and they are Courtney, who is on the right-hand side over here. She is currently 24 years old. She is getting her master's degree in nursing from the University of Arizona. Megan is on the far left. She's our middle daughter, and she is 22 years old, and she works at Desert Financial Credit Union. And then Peyton is our youngest in the middle there, and Peyton is starting high school this year. She's a freshman at Desert Vista High School. So I can say we successfully raised three kids through middle school, at least. That, that's where we are at this point. And I'm really proud of the work we did as parents, and I don't say that in a, to brag, but just to say getting through that stage of life is challenging, and each one of our girls were really different um, so that's a little bit about my family right there. In terms of my professional career, I have worked in all kinds of capacities in education, whether it was um, community education, I taught in the classroom, I've been a, an administrator at the middle school level for about 12 years now, and I am one of those crazy people that loves middle school. In fact, probably not a week goes by if I meet someone and I tell them what, what I do, their first reaction is like, oh, always, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, like I didn't choose to do this. I absolutely chose to do this, and I love what I do. I want to talk a little bit about why I love what I do. And this picture is 13-year-old me right there. Um, I was, I loved skateboarding. I hated school um, at that time. I often joke that, it's not really a joke, I say that, Seventh grade was the worst year of my entire life. It was probably also my parents' worst year of their entire lives um, because of me. And I'll share with you a little bit about why it was. Some of the highlights for me, or lowlights, I guess, in seventh grade, I, I thought it was horrible that they would make you sit in school all day for seven or eight hours and work, and then they would give you more work to do to take home. And so my solution to that was just to go home and tell my parents, oh, no, I don't have any homework. Uh, and that worked for a little while um, and, until it didn't work. And when the wheels came off, the wheels came off really bad. I still remember I was sitting or I was standing overlooking our front office. It was actually elevated and you could see the front office. And one of my friends nudged me with a laugh and said, hey, is that your mom walking into the office with Mr. Molinar, who was our principal? And I remember this sinking feeling of, oh, yes, that is my mom walking into the office with the principal, and I wonder what that's going to be about. And I found out later when they called me to the office and we proceeded to have a conversation about how they were considering holding me back in seventh grade. Uh, the next day, my mom spent the entire day with me sitting in the back of the classroom um, to ensure that I was on task and doing what I was supposed to do. And subsequently, I did figure it out and got with the program a little bit, and I did pass seventh grade and move on to eighth grade. But I share that just to say that if you would have told seventh or eighth grade me that I would someday be a middle school principal and someday be talking to parents about this, I would have thought you're crazy. In fact, my principal about three years ago ran into my mom and somewhere and asked what I was up to. And when she told him, he just started laughing. He thought it was hilarious. So 
I share that just to say that I'm, a, I'm one of the rare people that did not have a great school experience. It was, I was not successful as I went through school by traditional um, measurements, but it's what I love to do. I love middle school kids. I love all of them, the disenfranchised ones, the ones that are struggling, and I love to talk to parents about how we can help them do, uh, be successful and have an incredible experience. Before we get started, a few things I wanna reiterate before I even delve into what we're gonna talk about. First, parenting is hard. It's really hard. It's even harder in middle school because, and I don't need to tell you that, their prefrontal cortexes are not developed and they're making all kinds of horrible decisions and you're trying to manage that and I am not gonna say anything out of judgment. I wanna be helpful and supportive. Next, I don't have all the answers. I'll try to point you in the right direction. I'm gonna do some Q&A at the end, but I don't have all those answers. And there's no way we could cover all this in an hour. If we could, I'd be a millionaire and I'd be traveling around the country talking about that. We'll have some resources on the website after we're done tonight, so I know sometimes people are wanting to take pictures and do that. Feel free to do that if you want to, but there will be a PDF of the presentation on the website. And finally, I'm gonna talk to you about some things and you're gonna wanna walk out of here tonight and you're, <laughs> you're gonna wanna go home and start making changes. Do not do that. Take your time, really be strategic about that, Otherwise, it will end badly for you if you go home and you start trying to change things right away. So those are some things to remember before we get started. Now, again, I talked about middle school years, how to create an incredible experience. I wanna talk about that word incredible because I feel like we have to ground ourselves in that word. What does the word, or what does incredible look like? When we think about an incredible middle, middle school experience, I wonder what sorts of things come to your mind. And I looked it up on Google just to see what it said. So the definition is impossible to believe, difficult to believe, or extraordinarily extraordinary. And the last one, which is informal, I thought, is what most people think of, amazingly good or beautiful. So when you think about that incredible middle school experience for your children, I wonder what that looks like. For most people, they're gonna think things like they're getting great grades, they're measuring up to their potential, they are, they're developing extraordinary relationships with both their peers and the adults. Maybe there's some successes you think of in terms of athletics or other academic accomplishments, but you have this view of what incredible looks like. And I'm gonna ask you to reframe that tonight. That's the most important thing. Because the reality is, what I just described for you is not gonna be the typical middle school experience. And I actually want to tell you, you shouldn't want it to. You should want middle school to be a little bumpy for your kids because that is where they're going to grow. How many of you have heard of Carol Dweck? Has anyone heard of Carol Dweck? Awesome. Carol Dweck talks a lot about growth mindset. She's a professor out of the University of Stanford, a researcher, writer, does a lot of work. And this is a quote from her. In a growth mindset, challenges are exciting rather than threatening. So rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to reveal my weaknesses, you say, wow, here's a chance to grow. And I'm so excited that many of you recognized Dr. Dweck, and hopefully you've, you've looked into some of her work or seen some of her videos, but I want to challenge you to really look at the, ch the challenges, the failures, the struggles that your kids have as an incredible experience. It's very backwards, but it's critical in being able to guide them through that process because the reality is, this, this is important, your reaction to the things they come in contact with are gonna set the tone for how they respond to that. I was thinking the other day and I realized, you know what? Parenting doesn't change much from the time they're a toddler to the time they're in middle school in this way. I don't know how many of you remember when your kids were toddlers and they were just learning to walk and run. And I love this picture because it illustrates that they're really excited and then they start to fall and they hit the ground and the first thing they do almost every time is look up at their parents. And, and they're checking in like, should I be worried here? This hurt really bad. And I see parents usually react in one of two ways. You have the parents that jump up and run over, oh my gosh, are you okay? Or you have the parents that, that even on the inside, sometimes you're like, oh no, I think that was a bad one. 
you still have some kind of pre-rehearsed response. My wife and I, who's here in the room tonight, our, our response was always boom, and we would say it in a really playful way, and our daughters would often look at us and think, I don't think that was funny, and it doesn't feel good, but we didn't overreact to that, and almost every time, it would de-escalate and they would get back on track. So, I want to encourage you to think about this visual as you're thinking about the different things that come your way with your children. Now, this picture, I almost don't even like showing it because it bothers me that over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, we've, in education, I think got into a little bit of an adversarial role with parents. And we all have probably heard the term helicopter parenting. And um, that gave way, does anyone know what the new one is that everyone's talking about? Anyone? Lawnmower parenting. So if, if you think about it, helicopter parenting was this premise that parents are sort of hovering above kids and they're swooping in to rescue them uh, and help them in situations. Lawnmower parenting, they say, is kind of a step further and it's really just kind of removing all the obstacles out of their way so we clear a path. And I've never liked talking to parents about that because I always felt like it was combative, it was adversarial, and it didn't help us solve the problem. Because if I'm just telling people, hey, don't be a helicopter parent, or don't uh, be a lawnmower parent, it fails to recognize some important things. One, I think all of that flows out of love for children. I think people want their kids to be successful, and that's what they're doing, and they're doing what, what they feel like is best to do that. And I, I've never, in fact, I've done presentations about this and I've never included these slides until this year because I came across a book recently that changed my paradigm in terms of the way I viewed that. I don't know if anyone read The Coddling of the American Mind. I don't know if that's familiar to anyone. This book uh, by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff uh, really deals with a culture of safetyism and they say that it's interfering with young people's social emotional and intellectual development. It makes it harder for them to be autonomous adults who are able to navigate the bumpy road of life. And they shared a concept that is really resonating with me and I'm sharing it with parents now on my campus. And it's this, that we wanna prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. And that's something that we can do collaboratively. It's not saying, hey, don't be a helicopter parent or don't be a lawnmower parent. It's saying, hey, our goal is to do this together, and your kids are gonna come up to obstacles, and we want them to be able to figure that out and navigate it. As an educator, that doesn't mean I shirk my responsibility of responding to things. It just says that it's okay for them to struggle a little bit. And so tonight, what I wanna talk to you about more than anything else is how do we prepare them for the road? Rather than clearing that road for them, how do we prepare them for the road? And so, I want to start by telling you that every time we solve a problem for our children or remove an obstacle, otherwise known as preparing them for the road, we rob them of an opportunity to learn and grow. And we don't want to do that. I want you to think about these things, these questions. As you see your kid come in contact with struggles, think about these things. What's the worst thing that could happen here? Sometimes that answer might be pretty bad, but many times, I think it's a small thing that maybe they could learn from. What could they learn from this experience? What am I doing that they could be doing for themselves? Am I solving a problem they could solve on their own? Is this an opportunity to advocate for themselves? And this is a big one. I heard this years ago, and this has stuck with me for a long time. Remember this, the price tag for our mistakes is cheaper today than it will ever be for the rest of our lives. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this is critical. It's critical for us to pause and remind ourselves of this because as we talked about, you love your kids, you want them to be successful, and sometimes it seems like you could step in there and take care of that, but by doing that, we rob them of that opportunity to learn and grow. So, as an educator, you can imagine, I have lots of examples of parents preparing the road. I see it all the time. And more and more, I've tried to be more bold with parents, not in a confrontational way, but just to encourage them. But I wanna give you some examples. We see this every day at my school, and I, I implore our families not to do this, and it's lessened, but I still see it happening. 
Kids forget things and their parents bring them. We see homework. Now, we don't give it to the kids. The parents drop it off and we just say, okay, thank you. And we put it there and we put it in the teacher's box. But we're, we're not going to reinforce that. I see weird stuff like the cross-country kid forgot his shoes. And I see dad running in in a suit and tie, dropping these shoes off, you know, so that the son is ready for the cross-country meet. Water bottles, like we don't have drinking fountains. I don't, I don't always understand that one. Uh, lunches. Um, all of these things are in a well-intentioned place, but again, we're robbing kids of that opportunity. I'll see parents that I know are lying for their kids about tardies and absences to get those things excused. That always makes me sad. Grades, you know, kind of advocating and trying to get their kid maybe a better grade. Athletic teams, this is sadly probably the things that there's more energy about in school than anything else. Um, I've been an athletic director or a coach Parents get so into that, and again, it's all out of well-intentioned places, but you know, whether it's playing time or not making a team or any of those things, those are things we see them advocate or step in for. Conflict with their peers, conflict with adults. Um, family vacation, I put this one up because it's, it's a more benign one, but it's one that I try to reinforce. We'll have parents that, are, that advocate for their kids and say, hey, Mr. Martin, teachers, Johnny's going on a trip to Hawaii for a week. Uh, can you please make sure that he gets all of his work or whatever? And what I've encouraged my staff to do is to flip that back and say, you know, we, we feel like this is an opportunity for Johnny to reach out to his teachers and figure out what he needs to do to be successful if he's gone. So again, that's one of those things that I think sometimes people just aren't thinking about, but we try to shift that responsibility over. Sleepovers. This is one not school related, but it's one that I like because one of our daughters really struggled with this. She had a lot of anxiety about staying over at people's houses. And she would say, mom, dad, can I go sleep at so-and-so's house? And we'd say, sure, no problem. And then we'd sit down and we'd say, here's what's going to happen tonight. About two hours into this, you're going to call us and you're going to say, hey, can you come pick me up? And we're going to say no. Okay. So are you okay with that? Yes. Okay, and then we'd go and we'd meet with the parent. We'd say, okay, here's what's going to happen. In two hours, she's going to call us. She's going to go to you and say, hey, can I call my parents and see if they'll, they'll pick me up? We're not going to pick her up. Are you okay with that? And if the parent was okay with that, then we would move forward. And it happened over and over and over and over again, but it got less and less and less. And eventually, she is a strong young woman who doesn't have those same kind of anxieties because we didn't reinforce it and we communicated to her by our actions, you got this, you can handle it, we're not going to rescue you. This is one of my favorite ones. This is actually not my family, but it was a, a child was camping with my sister's family and us. We were just outside of Payson and uh, the parents let my sister and her husband know in advance, hey, um, we're a little bit afraid that he is going to get nervous and sometimes he gets a stomach ache and other things and we said he'll be fine, you know, no, no problem. Well, the second day, I was talking to my brother-in-law and he said, oh yeah, his dad's on his way up right now. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, he, he's not feeling good. He's a little nervous to his dad. His dad drove from Phoenix to Payson to pick him up and I... I was so sad for the boy because what his parents told him was, you don't got this, buddy. We'll come up and save you from that. And so I'm not trying to be mean-spirited or anything like that. It's all about that end game of preparing them for the road. This is another fun one for me and my family. Uh, years ago, uh, my wife, actually one of her friend's co-workers, um, was driving kind of an older car. It wasn't like a bad car or anything like that, but it, it definitely wasn't her car. And so my wife asked her, hey, what's going on with the, with the car? And, and she said, oh, well, we bought this for our child, but it's a five-speed. She can't drive a five-speed and won't do it, so she's driving the family car now and I'm driving this. And I thought, oh my gosh, like... Here's what a bad parent I am. I, my wife and I went and bought a five-speed car for our kids, and we said, you're going to learn how to drive a stick, uh, whether you like it or not, because we want you to figure this out. And our, our one daughter has, 
I don't know that she thanks us. She does make jokes about she, she's the only person that she knows that knows how to drive a five-speed, which is, I feel like, her way of encouraging us. But um, this is another example where the parent could have said, hey, we got you a car. I mean, it may not be exactly what you want. You can let it sit there and walk, but you're not driving our car. You can, you know, we'll be happy to let you learn how to drive this car if you want. So these are some examples of preparing for the road. We could probably sit here all night and share those. But I want to give you one that's an easy place to start. And if you're not already doing this, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I always, I, I feel, I don't want this to feel as if I'm confronting anyone. But if you're not already doing this, don't run home and do it tonight, but start figuring out what you need to do. If your kids are not waking themselves up in the morning and getting ready on their own, I would encourage you to start there. I would implore you to start there. We started our kids early on, second or third grade, we got them alarm clocks, and we got them waking themselves up. And I, I've talked to parents that thought, are you crazy? Now, we didn't put the alarm clock in the first day and say, you're on your own, and, and walk out. Like, we built that over time. And since our daughters have thanked us, the older ones have thanked us, the youngest is 14. It's going to be a while before we get any thanks. But um, they all appreciated that, and they're all really good at it. In fact, um, I'll start by saying that we live very close to our three schools of elementary, middle, and high school, and we did that strategically. We, as educators, knew that our schedules were fixed. My wife's a teacher, and so we wouldn't always have an opportunity to take kids and pick them up and different things, so we thought we need to be really close to the schools. And uh, our oldest two daughters, I don't think they ever slept in or were late for school, ever. And our, our last is actually probably the most responsible out of all of them. And last year, she's an eighth grader, and I get a text at about nine o'clock, and usually we're gone well before she got up, and the text said, Dad, I overslept. I texted back, bummer. Um, <laughs> can you come get me? I said, no, I'm at work. What do I do? I said, man, you're smart. You'll figure it out. And she did. She got herself ready. She went to school. Um, and again, I lived, we lived two blocks from the school. So it, it wasn't a huge deal for her to get herself to school. We might have had to brainstorm a little more. But I knew she had it in her. This is the part that kind of makes me laugh and makes me sad a little bit at the same time. So great kid, never been in trouble for anything. Walks into the front office at like 9.30. And one of the secretaries who knows her, you know, and knows your parents are educators and everything else, and we have a good relationship, the secretary says, hey, Peyton, what, what, why are you late today? She starts bawling <laughs> and crying. And uh, I say overslept. And, uh, and the po school policy is that if you had an unexcused absence, because she said, are you going to excuse this? And I said, no, I, I didn't sleep in. You did. I'm not going to excuse it. But what was funny was the school ended up excusing the absence because she'd never been in trouble for, for anything ever. And I was a little bit sad, like I kind of wanted her to get a lunch detention or whatever just to feel that or, uh, or whatever. But we got to talk later about something else which is good credit versus bad credit. And I talked to her about why do you think the school did that for you? Well, I've never been in trouble, I've never been late. I said, there you go. So we still use that as a teaching lesson, but I want to encourage you. If you haven't started doing this, please start soon. I also put a physical alarm clock up there because we're going to talk about technology a little bit later, and I'm going to encourage you not to have cell phones and other things in your kids' rooms at night. Get them an alarm clock, and that's the way to do it. All right, next, technology and screen time. This is one of the most complicated things and ever-changing things that I have ever encountered in my time as an administrator or a parent. I think about even, there's 10 years separating my oldest from my youngest. That landscape has evolved so much in the last 10 years, it's incredible. Um, there's decisions that I've made as a parent that I, I look back on and I would do it differently as an educator at the same time. I don't want to say anything out of judgment here. I just want to encourage you with some things. I want to talk about my evolution, if you will, first though. I love technology. I probably am going to look a little bit like a hypocrite. I have an Apple Watch. I have an, a, a 
iPhone. I, I love technology. I use it all the time. However, I want to share with you my story. So I, as, a, as an administrator, was often looked at in my district as one of the people pushing this kind of innovation, use of technology in the classroom, having kids have phones out for educational purposes, um, bringing their devices to school for uh, and allowing them to use it at lunch and passing periods and different things like that. I was on committees. Um, I was doing PD in our district. And all of it for me was about responsible digital citizenship. So for example, at three schools I was at, we would let kids use phones at lunch and my purpose for doing that was twofold. One, I thought they need to responsibly manage this and learn how to do it and I, I feel like we can help them do that. And the other thing I thought was if we give them an opportunity to use these things during lunch, maybe they're more engaged and focused during the school day. Th those, that's what my thought was. And I did that for years. A few years ago, we started getting some parent feedback and saying, eh, I don't think this is such a good idea. It was a small number. I wouldn't say I was dismissive about it, but I thought, nah, you know, I, I know some people feel differently about this, but I feel really strongly about responsible digital citizenship. And then all of a sudden, I just started seeing the wheels come off in different places and realizing, I think we got this wrong. I realized, I think we're not teaching responsible digital citizenship, and I don't think that kids can really handle this. In fact, I started feeling like letting them use the phones at lunch was almost like giving a drug addict drugs in the middle of the day and then expecting them to like function well. And I, and I don't say that like in, with hyperbole. I, I really am starting to think that's what goes on in a middle school brain. And what was funny was some of my teachers came to me. Now think about this. I'm like the innovative guy pushing technology, get phones out as much as you can for educational purposes, that stuff. I had two teachers ask to meet with me and they came in and they said, we think we should just get rid of phones completely in your backpacks, off during the day, whatever. We know, and I said, I'm with you, let's do it. And I, I think they had this whole spiel prepared like that they want to do it, and I was like, I think I was wrong. I, I want to do this. Uh, one of the things that changed my mind on this was the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. It deals a lot with technology, and does anyone know who Sean Parker is, by the way? Started Napster, do you remember that? I mean, that's how much technology evolves. He was, he was one of the um, early employees of Facebook. He joined Facebook in the first year, and there's, a, there's some quotes in The Coddling of the American Mind. He wasn't interviewed for that book, but they took some excerpts out of a, an interview that he'd done. And this is, when I read this, when some things started to crystallize for me. This is him talking. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever, and that's going to get you to contribute more content, and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. And the next line was the one that really hit me. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. I 100% agree with this, and it is destroying our children. I don't know that we have the data yet, longitudinally, to show it, but here's what we do have. We have some corollary data that I want you to see. And again, this is from the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. These are the adolescent depression rates. Kids aged 12 to 17 who had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. Look at what started happening in about 2011. Just shooting right up. And we see this all the time at school. Almost every social conflict that we see on our campus has some connection to social media. Whether it's Snapchat, Instagram. Snapchat's the big one right now, like with middle schoolers and high schoolers, I probably see the most there, but it's, 
It's really all of them. The other one, and I, I always hate sharing this one because it's such a serious topic, but I don't want to miss this one either. This is suicide rates per 100,000. So the numbers, you know, when you look and you look at, on the left and see, well, it's, you know, six, seven, six kids per 100,000 for girls, about 13, 14, 15 for boys. But realize what's happening is those rates are, are, have about doubled uh, in that length of time. The other thing to notice is that males is higher than females. A lot of people are surprised by that. Boys actually typically choose means of suicide that are more successful, and that's why those numbers are so much higher. So these are successful suicides. Uh, and again, that's a sobering slide to look at. It's not, correlation does not equal causation. I don't want to uh, imply that it does, but it is important that we recognize that there's something going on here. And I believe it has a lot to do with screen time, especially social media applications, but also boys aren't necessarily using social media the same way. Sometimes boys are, are on Fortnite and talking about things different ways, so I think sometimes we look at social media and think, well, my boy's not on Snapchat, you know, as much as the girls are or whatever, but they can get sucked into other things there as well. So what do we do? I remember going to my PTSO president last year and saying, hey, I really want to make some changes. We're, we're thinking about doing this stuff. I want to run it by you. And her response was, I agree with you. And I, I, she's someone who I collaborate with all the time and I have an enormous amount of respect for. She said, I agree with you, but I don't know how we unring this bell. And it, that hit me, but I said, me neither, but I'm going to try. And so as a school, here's some things that we've done. First thing is we started really hard and fast on the district policy with phones. So often in your backpack once the bell rings and they stay in there all day. And I've even had a couple staff people that were kind of sneak in things because what, the, what our staff would do sometimes is they would reward kids by um, letting them listen to music if they finished a test early or finished an assignment. And what some of our teachers started to realize is that kids were rushing through tasks just to get access to their cell phones. And so we collectively put an end to that and that's been one of our commitments. The other thing we did is we started a committee with parents and staff and we just started talking about it. Like, I don't even know where to go. Um, I, I talked to a few people who do this work regularly and I said, where, where should we start? They said, read the book Glow Kids, go from there. Anyone read that book, by the way? Fantastic book. It, it's incredibly informative and incredibly scary. So when you, I encourage you to read it, but you'll have to put it down sometimes and, and really rethink what you're doing. As parents, what can you do? Don't be in a hurry, and by this, I kind of mean twofold. One, don't rush off tonight and take your kid's phone away and shut things down or whatever. Don't be in a hurry there. And also, don't be in a hurry. I don't know where your kids are in terms of development or age, but they got lots of time. And I'll tell you, we had a, we had a middle schooler who would come home and tell us, I am the only person at my school who doesn't have Instagram. All the way through middle school, we heard that. Uh, we had her earn that, and she had to read Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens and write us a paper on why we had her do that before she could have Instagram. And then we met regularly uh, and talked about that. And we did eventually get, give her that. But um, when I say don't be in a hurry, just there's, there's still time for them to get those things down the road. Read Glow Kids, I encourage you to do that. No screens in the room at night. And this is one of the things that I think I, as a lover of tech, I messed up. Because when my youngest was, I don't even remember how old, we bought her an iPad, and she was a pretty responsible kid. And um, we, at the time, I was like, well, she can use her iPad as her alarm, and, you know, and, and different things like that. And I wish that we hadn't done some of those things because it made it harder to scale some of that back. Use parent controls if you're not doing that. Um, iPhones have some of that screen time stuff embedded in it. There's lots of good applications out there. I use one called Our Pact, which let, allows me to control some things. 
you can just do some research on that. There's lots of options out there, but if you're not doing that, do it. My daughter's a freshman. Her phone still shuts down at 10.30 every night and is basically a brick and she can't use it for anything. Um, she hates me sometimes for that, but that's okay. I love her too much to let that be an issue. And consider a family contract. There's lots of stuff online, resources about that. I'd look into that. Uh, and finally, this is the big one, model the desired behavior. Kids think we're hypocrites, and we often aren't. A few years ago, I remember my wife and my kids would confront me on how much I was on my phone, and uh, I was dismissive. I'm just checking some emails from work, or I rarely get on and do this, and I did realize, you know what? I'm on it too much, and I need to stop. And so now, even at dinner, I always leave my phone in the kitchen somewhere, so I'm not even tempted to do that. When we go out to restaurants and things like that, we're committed to putting our phones away and not having those things out. But we, we really need to model that desired behavior for our kids. Um, that's, that's really important. All right, now, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some parenting stuff here that's more general, and here's why I wanna do this. Because I just laid some things on you that are gonna cause you to maybe rethink some things you're doing and you're gonna wanna come home and start making some changes with your kids. Whether it's you know, giving them more ownership, letting them struggle, letting them fail at things, transferring power back to them, um, putting some controls in for technology that maybe aren't there. And here's what's not gonna happen when you start to make those changes. Your kids aren't gonna go, oh, thanks, mom and dad. This is awesome. I'm so glad you're looking out for my future. They're gonna freak out more than they already do as middle schoolers. And I wanna share this with you. I, is anyone familiar with Parenting with Love and Logic or Teaching with Love and Logic, those resources? These are, to me, the most useful things that I've ever encountered in my career as an educator and as a parent. But it wasn't always that way. When my wife and I, my wife and I actually got married 18 years ago. My oldest, our oldest was six years old, and Megan, who was the youngest at the time, was four years old. And it was hard becoming a parent instantly. I, I didn't have kids or anything like that, but I'd been in education. I was pretty confident. I, you know, for, for a while, things were going really good. And then we started struggling with, with Megan, and she wouldn't, go, she wouldn't go to bed and stay in her room, and she would come out, like, all the time, and, we tried all this stuff and nothing was working. And finally I told my wife, hey, remember that book we got when we got married that I thought had a silly title and someone gave it to us and I thought, we're not reading a book on parenting. Where's that book? We, we need that book. Like, because I, I don't know any other books right now, so go. we found that book, we started reading it. It was Love and Logic. And I can honestly tell you that it changed our lives because we started to anticipate things that were gonna happen as parents and we felt empowered and prepared and not only did it change our lives I think it helped us develop two and then three responsible kids and so I want to share some things with you the first thing we're going to talk about is putting an end to arguing back talk and begging and I'm going to go through some of this stuff pretty quick because I do want to get some Q&A at the end um, I'm pretty sure all of us have this issue uh, if you have kids at all, you have this issue. The first step is when those things happen, just go brain dead. Don't, don't start to think about it too much because if you do, you will get angry and you will argue. Next, avoid lectures. We're all really skilled at that. They don't care and it's not gonna work. In fact, I heard this once and I try to remember this as much as possible and I am a world-class lecturer. I have really smart things to say to my kids but I've tried to say, I'm gonna save words for happy time. All right, next. Step two, step one, brain dead. Step two, calmly repeat a one-liner. This was one of the best things that happened to my wife and I, and we still do some of these things today. My favorite, I love you too much to argue with you. <laughs> and sometimes they'll go, I know, I love you too much to argue with you, and they'll say it back to you, which is even more thrilling for me to, to know that I won that. Thanks for sharing. Well, so-and-so has Instagram. Thanks for sharing and just keep repeating it over and over again. Maybe so, that's another good one. Especially when they're comparing, their parents are way better, they get, maybe so. 
Well, I'm just going to go live with, especially if you're in a, a split family, sometimes you'll get that threat. I love you wherever you live. Like, that's a good one just to, to de-escalate that. And then this is a good one, but don't say this unless you absolutely mean it, because I've, I, we've never really used this one, but I've heard that parents get a knock at the door at 6 a.m. Okay, I'm, re I'm ready to argue about what we, we were talking about. So if you do say that one, just be prepared for it. All right, another thing we gotta do is we gotta teach responsibility. They don't just learn it naturally. So kids who are allowed to learn from small mistakes early in life are far less likely to make tragic mistakes later on. So this is another one, we're reframing that, we're, we're recalibrating that, we're realizing that if they make mistakes, it's good because now hopefully they won't make that mistake later on. And again, I told you earlier, the price tag for our mistakes is cheaper today than it will ever be for the rest of our lives. It's important though, use empathy. As you're going through this process and you're teaching them responsibility, don't be sarcastic, don't lecture. Empathy is a great way to hold them accountable but not lose their love and respect. And this can be really, really, really hard. But I'm gonna give you a framework to think about that I think will help you, it helped us. When you look at things that are happening, try to determine is this an affordable or an unaffordable thing for them to go through. Let me give you some examples. Forgetting their lunch, totally affordable. Some parents at my school don't think so. But I try to reinforce to them, people can live for weeks without food, and I'm pretty sure that your child is gonna be okay if they go a few hours. They, it might be uncomfortable, um, but they're gonna be okay. So that's an example of affordable. Unaffordable, chatting with strangers online, okay? If, if they're online gaming and different things like that or chatting, you can't go, well, I'm gonna see how this plays out. Like, that's not one that's an affordable thing. You're gonna have to step in and do that. Staying up too late, another one, totally affordable. They're gonna learn that lesson, but there's an another one, playing video games for hours. We can't just let, they're never gonna shut that off, and it could possibly do some irreparable damage there. Forgetting to do homework. Let them figure that out, let them suffer the consequence. Why? Because remember, we talked about that long term. They're less likely someday to forget to do a project at work if they've learned that. That's not something you will have control of at, at the end of their life. Hopefully, hopefully when they have projects for work, they're not still living with you. I hope so. Um, so. More on teaching responsibility. This is an important one. Don't be afraid to delay consequences. This was one of the most magical things that, that ever happened to my wife and I. Uh, I told you that our daughter kept coming out of her room late at night, and I'm talking, she would come out six, seven times, and we would try everything. We tried consequences, we tried whatever, and the most magical thing happened when we discovered delayed consequences. Because she'd come out and we'd say, if you come out again, the consequence will be this. And okay, you came out again. And then you're like piling on, you're grounded forever, and you, this is taken away, or whatever. And in Love and Logic, we read something about delaying consequences, and it was glorious. I still remember we were sitting on the couch just waiting because we knew she was going to come out. We were like, okay, we got this tonight. So she comes out, stands in the hallway and looks at us. We did our whole thing. You know, where are you supposed to be right now? She, well, I'm scared. Where are you supposed to be right now? Well, I wanted to, and we went through that. And, and then I said, okay, well, you know what? We're gonna have to do something about this. I don't know what yet, but don't worry, we love you a lot. We'll figure something good out. We'll take care of it. Try not to worry about it. Well, what are you gonna do? I said, I don't know. Everything we do doesn't work. We're gonna have to think of something way better, but it's gonna take us some time. We love you a lot. We'll figure it out. Try not to worry about it. Every time you say try not to worry about it, it makes me worry about it more. Ugh, maybe you want to go back to your room. I, I don't know. I will think of something. Don't worry. So it did not magically change overnight, but over time, this started working. And less, what we realized she was doing is she was doing the math. She was standing in her room like, okay, I'm going to be grounded for two days. I can live with that. I'm going out. 
But when it became unknown, she couldn't tip the scales at all. And so we, um, we were helping her with that. I knew it worked one day. <laughs> this was awesome. We were swimming one day. And she came over. She swam up. I was laying on a raft. And she said, Dad, in a little while, I'm going to come tip you over on this raft. <laughs> Try not to worry about it. <laughs> and she swam away to the other side of the pool. And I, I thought, man, uh, I think we won that battle. So that was a great thing that helped us. Setting enforceable limits. All the time, we, we say things to our kids that there is no way we can enforce at all. And there's, a, there's in the Love and Logic or on the Love and Logic website, they have something called enforceable versus unenforceable statements and turning your words to gold. Again, I have links for this at the end, but I want to show some of them to you. An unenforceable statement, don't roll your eyes at me. We've all said silly things like that, that there's no way we can really control and probably will actually make them roll their eyes more. Here's something you could say. I do extra things for people who treat me with respect. And you can control that. I, I mean, just, just today, our, our youngest called, asked my wife, I think texted, said, hey, can I have a friend over? Uh, you know, we let kids have friends over who clean up their rooms and their bathrooms. She hadn't done it. And I'm sure she's really angry at us right now, but she's going to think about that tonight, and hopefully she'll clean her room and the bathroom. We'll see. Unenforceable. Stop spending all of your time playing video games. You cannot enforce that. Enforceable. I allow video games in this home as long as I think they aren't causing any problems. And you're totally in control of that. Another one. <laughs> Leave each other alone when they're in the back of the car. And how many times have we said that in some scenario as a parent? And we're frustrated. This is a good one. I charge $2 a minute when I have to listen to kids argue. You can set the dollar amount. I don't know what the economy is in your, in your home. That's an arbitrary uh, example. But these are things, and there's a whole list of them on there. So I'd encourage you to go to their website and look these up. These are great things that, that we were able to use as parents. Sharing control. This is another big one. Give some of the control over to kids. But you got to have some rules with this. Number one rule, only give choices that fit into your value system. So I'm going to encourage you to give choices, but really think about them carefully because they have to fit into what your value system is. Give most choices when things are going well. This breaks down when you're already in conflict. So try to do this almost proactively. Give choices before the child is resistant. Once they dig their heels in, it will not work. For each choice, give two options that you like. I'll, I'll give you some examples of these in a minute. Use care not to disguise threats as choices. This is hard uh, because, you know, <laughs> would you rather behave correctly or me drag you out of here by your neck? Like, you can't, you can't say things like that or, or threaten to have things taken away or whatever. Actually give two choices. That are, that are decent choices that you're okay with. And finally, once you give the two choices, if they don't choose quickly, choose for them. And don't let them go, no, 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 I'll, I'll do that. You make the choice and you move forward. If you go back on it and you let them make the choice, this will not work long term. You have to do that. I use this, we don't have to do this with our kids as much anymore. I use it a ton at school with kids. I'll give them two choices. And then if they don't choose, I go with the one I want, and they try to squirm out of that, and I don't let them. Here are some examples now. Will you be wearing your coat or carrying it? I see parents all the time arguing with their kids about bring your coat, bring your jacket, whatever. Just say, hey, you want to carry your coat or you want to wear it? And then toss it to them and, and walk out. Do you want to leave now or in five minutes? This is a good one, not only for little kids, it's actually a joke in our family. My whole family says this to each other now, like the adults. Do you want to go now or in five minutes? So that everyone, although they make fun of me, I see them doing it with their own kids and with each other now. And you can choose any amount of time there. I think my wife does that with me sometimes, by the way, too, because I talk too much. So she has to tell me, do you want to leave now or in five minutes? Um, do you want to do your chores now or in an hour. This is a great one. If you want tasks done, ask them when they want to do it. A lot of times I'll set the timer on the microwave. I'll ask my daughter, hey, do you want to do this task now or in 
30 minutes, 30 minutes. Okay, I'm setting the microwave timer. And then I just walk away and she comes out once she hears the timer and she takes care of it. Doesn't always have a smile on her face, but I don't have to argue with her, so I'm fine with that. Are you going to turn the TV off now or in 15 minutes? Another good one. And are you going to turn off your cell phone or just ignore it until after dinner? Again, though, with the cell phone stuff, you have to model that. Don't forget that. All right. Guiding kids to solve their own problems. This is one of the last things that we're going to talk about. I talked to you a little bit before about providing a strong and sincere dose of empathy. Sometimes this is hard to provide empathy because sometimes what they're going through is pretty silly and you almost want to laugh about it. Or sometimes you're frustrated with them. It's hard to be empathetic. Or sometimes you want to lecture them and tell them everything they've done wrong. Start with empathy, though. Man, I'm sorry. That's a bummer. Whatever, whatever it is you choose to do, lovingly hand the problem back to them. When they bring it to you and say what's going on, man, that stinks. What are you going to do? You're having, you know, I, I failed a test. That's a bummer. What are you, you going to do to fix that? This is critical. Get permission before you share any ideas with them. And it, sometimes they'll say no. I don't want any ideas. Okay. Let me know if you change your mind. And then almost always they'll come back to you and say that. But get permission before. Provide a brief menu. So you want to know what I've seen a couple people do or what worked for me? Provide a couple things and then walk through it with them to evaluate it. You know, well, what do you think would happen if you tried this? Those sorts of questions. And then at the end, let them learn from solving or not solving. Whatever happens at that point, let them do the learning. Don't go back to them and say, well, I told you, if you would have just done this or whatever, you rob them of that opportunity. And finally, remember this. Wise parents only step in when they are certain that their child has a problem that's too big or dangerous to solve on their own. So when they bring you that problem, don't react right away. Really try to think about this. Is this one too big for them to solve on their own? And you'll, you'll find them. I mean, we've had, we've had a few along the way where we have to step in and we have to navigate it. But I will tell you the bulk of the problems that our kids brought to us were things that we could hand back over to them. And as our older kids have come back to us, they have thanked us for doing that. In fact, my, my oldest daughter was a RA in college, uh, which was a tremendous experience for her. And she would come to us and say, oh my gosh, you won't believe how irresponsible these people are that I, that I have to work with. Or their parents are showing up and trying to talk to me about the problems that they're having or, or whatever. So your kids will thank you for this someday, not in the middle of it, but always try to think about that. So that's really it. I close with that slide just to remind you, this is something I keep at the center of what we talk about. Every parent meeting we have, I start with this. We're going to put this up in our, um, our conference room where we do our meetings, that this is our goal. We want to prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. So that's it. I do have some resources that will be up there for you um, on the website if you want to do that. But I did. we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any or, or try to. So I don't know if, if anyone does. Feel free to take pictures there. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. If you look at the, um, through the, what are my thoughts on financial literacy, allowances, things like that. The Love and Logic stuff is what we used. They, their principles were really about, um, don't give kids, they should do chores and other work around the house because they're part of the family. So not connecting those things necessarily. I mean, maybe you want to give extra money for an extra job or whatever. But So that's the first thing. They separated those two things. And then they said um, that give them money. And uh, we it actually said, and we found, my wife found one of the envelopes probably, what, two weeks ago or something like that. And what they said to write on it was, because we love you, spend it wisely. 
and that we would, we would give them that envelope. And we, we found one of those the other day and it, it was really neat to see that. So, you know, really giving them the money and letting them manage it, and that's hard, because our oldest was, she would save, and our middle daughter, like, she would get something. <laughs> <laughs> be like, can we go to the store? You know, and, and she's she's still a little bit like that, uh, but she's learning. She just actually bought her first house and some other stuff, so transferring that over. The other um, organization, Dave Ramsey, uh, I don't know if you follow Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University, has a ton of stuff for kids. That's another one that I would direct parents to. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 I've seen different things in different publications, and I don't remember exactly. Usually, it's about an hour to two hours a day. But if you see the research right now, it is ridiculous. I mean, it's like some kids, the, the averages are up like 8, 9, 10, 11 hours a day because what's happening, what's driving those averages up a lot is two things, I think. One is they're having their screens in the room and they're on it all the time. And remember, that can be TVs, whatever. I mean, so many parents have TVs in their kids' room. Again, we're horrible parents. We've never done that. Um, my daughter hates us for that, but that's okay, I can live with that. The other thing is school, though. We've really started to analyze that, and I don't want to, Dr. Bacher or anyone else to think that I'm saying get rid of computers at school or anything, but we've really tried to analyze, like, what are the benefits in this given thing for screen time right then? But usually it's about an hour to two hours. Yes? Yeah, we, you know what, our staff, it was, so her question was, what is our policy when we're asking kids to put phones away, but then the adults maybe aren't doing that? And our staff, I was so proud of them because they made that commitment on their own. They just said that the teachers that really drove this said, we want, we feel like if we're going to ask kids to do this, that we need to do it too. And there's some exceptions. Like our staff, you know, we had someone who had a, fa a parent that was ill recently and he came to me and he said, just so you know, if you ever walk in my room and you see my phone out, I, you know, I, I told my kids that I need to be on call. And so we want to be reasonable about that. But we even talked to our kids. We told them that, hey, we're going to model this too and put our phones away. And it's been hard because I use my phone a lot for email and stuff as I'm bouncing around school. But I am really careful now not to pull it out if I'm in a hallway or, or, or visible with kids. So. But that's a hard one. Again, we have to model that behavior. We have time, maybe a couple more minutes if there's, yes. Uh-huh. Well, I think that that's important. What you said at the end is the most critical thing, right? We're, we're trying to manage that because the last thing you want to do is just control all of it. It's almost like in education we would call it scaffolding where we, we're putting those supports in place and, and we're, we're taking those things away as necessary or fading those supports, if you will, uh, because we ultimately want them to be able to manage that, right? Like for me, um, I don't know if this was right or wrong, but going into our daughter's freshman year, we did allow her to have Snapchat. And again, we have parent controls and we have some other stuff and we really monitor that. But when my wife and I talked about it, we kind of made the decision, well, like someday she's going to have this and so it's better maybe for us to kind of manage it or whatever, but we didn't do it when she was in fifth grade. You know, like you have to figure that out. And for every kid it's different. And I think that I will say definitely there are more positive things for online experiences, but what they will, 
the experts say is 60 to 90 minutes before shutting screens down because it starts to affect sleep. So even, even if it's a positive thing, the screen time can mess with like melatonin levels and some other things. I'm not a scientist, but that's what I've heard. And so I would, I would guard against that. But I think what you're doing in terms of watching her and letting her manage that responsibly until you have to step in is probably a wise thing. All right, one more minute, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a more passive, yeah. And, you know, that's not something that, that I'm a real expert in, but they definitely, you know, what you're doing versus playing Fortnite, very, di <laughs> very different in terms of what's going on in the brain or whatever. So, yeah, you definitely want to differentiate those things. I think the big thing that they talk about is, is that 60 to 90 minutes before bedtime, you know, really just trying to avoid it. But you're exactly right. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for letting me come tonight and talk to you. And as I said, they're going to get those resources up on that website. I would encourage you to find that. The one at the top was the one thing I didn't uh, address tonight. Um, if you've never watched the TED Talk by Angela Duckworth called Grit, um, I do talk about that sometimes, but that is an incredible thing to view, and her book is awesome too. But. Uh, I hope you get out there and you're working hard to prepare your child for the road. Thanks for coming tonight. Appreciate it.